Now I'd like to invite Professor Kara Sikora to present his case for opposition. Okay, students, listen. I was at Corpus Christi College, Cambridge, well before you were all born in this room. Fantastic. Why was the college founded? It was founded in 1352, paid for by the Towns Guild as a thank you to God for the relief of the, pla the plague that had been there in 1348. I lived in the old court, the first complete courtyard in Cambridge that's still standing. What did my predecessors look there? They looked like this. <laughs> Plague mask. It was PPE in medieval England. And what happened, not, not the degree you do here, but uh, personal protection, in the beak would be stuffed with herbs. And that was supposed to stop the contagion, whatever it was, they had no idea what it was at the time. Complete rubbish. Much of the stuff we hear about COVID, the tools used in public health, are complete rubbish. There is no good scientific evidence. A good example, the Joint Committee of Vaccination and Immunization two weeks ago suggested that immunizing ch children between 12 and 15 is not worth it. The risk benefit isn't worth doing. It was overturned for political reasons, uh, so they wouldn't infect adults. Crazy decision to have your experts turned down. So as we move on, of course, democracy and liberty and, and safety are on opposite ends of the spectrum. And I have to agree with our first speaker, very eloquently put, the safety belts walking on motorways, walking on runway 27 right at Heathrow, not a good idea for everyone's sake. And then things like um, drink driving, not good because you could harm others as well as yourself. And then what about having sex in the Bodleian Library out on the of the library? Do you believe in that? We have rules to stop people. You get arrested if you have sex there. And quite rightly, I don't object to having rules. But when it comes to public health, the rules have to be evidence-based. Like everything I do in cancer, I treat cancer patients, it's evidence-based. Public health, in many cases, good respect to Alison Pollock, a leader in the field, is just not evidence-based. And as we move on now, uh, we look at the key problem with public health and where it comes to this debate of what's called MPIs, non-pharmacological intervention. Not drugs, not vaccines, but doing something. Face masks, social distancing, uh, lockdowns, closing schools, closing, closing universities, confining students to the room and putting security guards outside. This is, this is an NPI to try and dampen down the magic R factor. Even my eight-year-old granddaughter knows what an R factor is now. And the, it, incredible times. The other thing is test and trace. And we've heard a little bit about it. That is 23 billion pounds of our money. Most of it was wasted. In the end, the only way they could get the program running was not through fantastic public health, not through the NHS, but hiring private contractors KPMG were collecting £1,000 a day for their senior officers <coughs> to come and try and sort it out. All the Hancock really went for a blast in army camps on the Isle of Wight. None of it worked when it was put out there. I don't know how many of you have downloaded the NHS app for COVID. I certainly haven't, I can tell you. <laughs> if we move on, the problem the government had was to install a culture of fear. Stay home, protect the NHS, save lives. The posters of people looking as though they were about to die from COVID, would you wear a mask to save this event from happening? All these things went around the place. The culture of fear was everywhere. The Archbishop of Canterbury last Easter, the Easter before last, held Easter service in his kitchen of all places. He only lives 500 yards from the cathedral. He couldn't go there. He was too frightened to go there. The BBC wouldn't go to the cathedral because government orders were shut. We don't open places of worship. People died for their religion over the ages. He wasn't prepared to walk down the road. For goodness sake, what's gone wrong with people? The culture of fear carries on now. You can see it on the streets. People are scared stiff. 
for their own health that they're going to die. When we look at the collateral damage, it's particularly sad. And I've been very vocal on Twitter about cancer, because that's my specialty. It's not just cancer. Heart attacks, strokes, suicides. The Humber Bridge footpath was closed for about three months to install more suicide <coughs> barriers, because six young people, all under 23, jumped off the bridge and killed themselves. So the, the, the collateral damage is profound. In cancer, it's particularly profound. What the lockdown did was, first of all, stop patients going to their doctor at all. It also stopped GPs from providing a decent service. And we were still seeing that, in that they weren't seeing patients in person. The Zoom calls, telephone calls are great if you know someone and the symptoms are established, you've done the tests. But they're not good if you don't know what's going on. Someone's got a bit of indigestion, a bit of abdominal pain, lost a couple of stone in weight. They're likely to have some serious pancreatic or other intestinal type of cancer. It wasn't sorted out. The, an estimate from UCLH uh, six months ago was published, a sort of very sophisticated back of the envelope calculation that something like 50,000 people would have died uh, from cancer because of COVID almost more than those that have died of COVID. And of course, the average age of death of COVID was 82.4 years. The cancer patients were far younger. The heart attack patients were far younger. The hospitals stopped operating for periods of time. Cancer patients on chemotherapy were stopped in mid-course in some place. We managed to continue. But a lot of places took the doctors away and put them in the intensive care units, the, the cancer specialists, to, to help the COVID fight. But, you know, the cancer patients are going to suffer for many years to come. We've still got a problem there. So the collateral damage is really very serious. Moving forward, we've got to change things. We've got to let the COVID become endemic in our society. It is. Australia and New Zealand went a different route, and now they're beginning to backtrack. You can't achieve zero COVID, even if you have the most fantastic public health system in the world. It just isn't possible. You've got to do something different. You've got to, if you like, welcome it. It's a tiny little virus, 31,000 uh, base pairs, your six billion base pairs, in, well, three billion base pairs in all of us in this room. All of us are different, although we share something like 98% of our genome with a monkey. So there you go. And, and we're all different amongst ourselves. But the differences at the gene level are tiny. This virus has managed to thwart a whole of society across the world. We've got lots of experiments to understand. The best experiment of COVID was the Diamond Princess, the cruise ship that anchored in Yokohama. No one knew what to do. The Japanese public health is wonderful. It's very good. No one knew what to do. 3,500 people on board, 700 tested positive with PCR, and then 300 actually had COVID symptoms. 14 died but they were in an enclosed space. It was like a perfect incubator for a laboratory. You could work out what was going on. All this data is going to come. It's all going to be put together. Different countries, you've heard about Sweden. You know, the mortality in Sweden is less than the mortality here. So, you know, we haven't got it right for whatever reason. You could argue was 23rd of March the right day to impose lockdown. Does it really matter? And if you look at the data in different ways, you look at it and you say, it probably doesn't matter. These are very soft signs. The evidence base, as I said at the very beginning, is exactly like that plague mask. It's pretty weak. But that plague mask protected either the doctor or when he went from patient to patient, because it would be a he in those days. I'm not being misogynistic. I can't pronounce that word either. And uh, that was the problem, that we've got to understand the science behind what we do. Politicians are very difficult because they go to do PPE at Oxford predominantly, or Cambridge. Uh, we don't have PPE at Cambridge, I don't think. But anyway, they're, they're not scientists. And those that are uh, have left the field for a long time. They can't be analytical about the data. So, you know, we're all in the same storm. Rich people, poor people but we're all in different boats. The investment banker behind me, who I'm sure will one day live in a beautiful large house with several acres of land, have some servants around him, is a very different boat for him if, if COVID hits and he has to go into lockdown from a, an, an unmarried mother with, with three small children under seven living in a high-rise building with inadequate accommodation. 
It's different for a gig economy worker compared to a university lecturer. I click, he, he's gonna, he or she is going to continue to get paid. The gig worker is going to get nothing. A pub owner who owns the pub, he's going to get nothing if he has to shut. You know, these people will end up on unemployment benefits, without a job, without a career. The implication of some of the COVID measures, the COVID laws, which are very difficult for the police to enforce, as you all know, it's, it's just, it, it just, just no, again, has no evidence base in medicine. So I would say, you have a choice this evening. You can vote for the proposals of this motion. I like hats. And, or, you can... Remember, we know where you live. If you vote for the others, we'll come and get you. You'll be subjugated into submission by a government who doesn't understand disease, medicine, or public health. Thank you very much. Please vote.